Gideon, Elijah, and David. David, the guy who slew the giant. Gideon, the guy who took 300 and conquered the multitude. And then Elijah, who called down fire on the mountain. Amen? Those are the three individuals we want to talk about tonight. Gideon, if you don't, I'm going to give you some backstory. You can read this later on. It's awesome people to do a character study on. Judges 6.11, you'll find Gideon. But as you turn there, Gideon's people worshipped idols. God's people, these are Israel, God's chosen people, they had forsook their God and they had lifted up idols in their life. They had become consumed with idol worship. And God allowed situations to come to them. He didn't cause them, but he allowed an enemy to come in to stir them up, to make them uncomfortable so that they would cry out to him and want freedom and want him back. Amen. God knows how to make us uncomfortable. And God's people have been worshiping idols, so the enemy comes in and overthrows God's people. So every year, this enemy would come in and burn their crops, burn their houses, take away slaves, kill them, and then they would go back and they would wait till the next season and they would come back and do it again. You're talking years of this chaos coming in. It would literally be like someone sweeping through park hills and burning down houses and taking stuff that they want. And you'll find that Gideon actually had his brothers killed by the Midianites, the bad guys. So Gideon is going through seven years of raids, burnt houses, fields being burned, people being killed. They're stealing his food. His own brothers had died. And Gideon is found in a cave hiding, Judges 6.11. Now an angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizurite while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. In this moment, it doesn't seem like Gideon is a mighty warrior. In fact, Gideon does not have a sword and none of the Israelites have a sword. That's what happens when the enemy comes in. They take the weapons of your warfare so you can't defend yourself, so you can't fight for your family. And they begin to come after you and come after you. And through seasons of this, you lose the will to fight. And we find Gideon here without a sword, without the will to fight. He is literally hiding in a cave, this small amount of food, hoping to live out this meager life. He's laid down his sword. He had faced circumstances that caused him to lay down his sword. He didn't just do it on his own. He was a warrior. He was someone who fought for his family at one point. He was someone who prayed for his lost loved ones at some point. He was someone who stood in the gap and wept over the community that he lived in, asking God to save them at one point. But he had lost the will to fight. He no longer prayed for the lost. He no longer served those who were hurting. He no longer gave his time to people who needed it. He laid down his sword. Amen. He had seen family and friends killed by the enemy. He watched the enemy burn down their houses and steal their food. He had his own, no doubt, he had his own friends and family taking away captive. So there were still people alive in the enemy's camp that Gideon knew that should be sitting next to him eating food, but he's hiding in a cave without a weapon, unwilling to go fight for those people. This is a powerful moment to think about. And an angel of the Lord comes in there and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. That seems backwards. Gideon isn't a coward. He had been beaten down so long, so far. It wasn't that God hadn't called him. It wasn't that God didn't have a plan for him. He had dismissed himself. Gideon blamed everyone around him for the defeat that they lived in. Gideon went on to say that I am the least in my father's house, and my father's house is the smallest of the tribes. He thought so lowly of himself, he had changed his identity Because of his circumstance, Gideon's identity was defined by his circumstance, not his God. For Gideon, his life had become all about the struggle. Amen? Then we're going to jump to Elijah, 1 Kings 19. Elijah literally just called down fire and killed a bunch of pagan worshipers. People who had murdered God's holy priest, they murdered him. Just like Elijah. Elijah was a servant of God, and there were a bunch more servants of God. And the bad guys literally killed them all. And Elijah says, all right, let's have a showdown. They go to the mountain. He calls down fire and they kill all the pagan priests. They kill, they basically push back the darkness in their land for one more night, right? That is a powerful moment in scripture. But then as you read on, Elijah 
goes through a season. He goes through a really fast changing season. He just had a victory in 1 Kings 19. Ahab the king told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. He had killed all the false prophets. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if you do not make, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them tomorrow. Uh, basically what she's saying, you killed my priest and if I don't kill you the same way, I'm a liar. I'm going to, She's basically just sent a huge stern warning. She was going to destroy him. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, hold up, he left his servant there. Then he went in a day's journey into the wilderness. Why would he leave his servant? Why would he embrace isolation? He knows the power. This guy has already felt alone enough. He feels like he's the only one fighting for God. He feels like he's the only one praying. He feels like he's the only one pushing back the darkness in God's name. And then he willingly tells his servant to stay here while I embrace the wilderness, while I go into isolation. He's choosing wilderness. He's choosing dry land. He's choosing desert. How many of us have done that? Just like Gideon, who finds himself without the fight, without the will to fight, without a sword. Elijah is running from the enemy that he just had a victory over. And now he's embracing the wilderness. Let's read on. He left his servant there, verse 4. But he himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. How do these great and mighty men, these warriors, find themselves at a place of utter defeat? They have no will to fight. They've allowed situations, circumstances, struggles, the enemy. They've allowed it to define their call. They've allowed it to define their future. At this point, there is no future for Elijah. Is that God's future for Elijah? Is it God's will that he's sitting in a desert, alone, isolated? No, God didn't call him to do that. In fact, as he traveled on, God would ask him the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? You're out of my will. You've stepped out of the plan that I have for you. What are you even doing in this isolated, lonely place? This is not what I have for you. How do we find ourselves there? And that's that's the word that's coming is the word that he spoke to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Some of us have laid down our sword. Some of us have been hit so hard with the seasons of life. We don't have the fight in us that we used to have. We don't serve like we used to serve. We don't worship as passionately as often as we should. And I feel the Lord coming alongside some great and powerful leaders in the church. I mean, honestly, if this isn't the core of our church, I don't know what is. But I feel him saying, pick up your sword out of the dust. I know you've watched people walk away from the church. I know you've watched people walk out of your life. They used to serve Jesus. I know you've invested years into people and to see them turn their back on you and leave the church. I know that, God says, but I'm calling you to rise up and grab your sword off the dirt and to start fighting with the same excitement that you used to have when you first found me because the fight is getting more intense. In fact, the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent will take it by force. And if we can't even find our sword, if we can't even come together as one body and push forward against the darkness, then all the captives, all of our loved ones, all the community that does not know Jesus, they will stay where they are and the darkness will stay where it is. How many of us in this room, you still come to church? You still listen to worship music. You still call yourself a Christian. You are. But how many of you have resigned to a cave? You've resigned yourself. You've accepted this position of a little bit of bread. No fight. No will to push forward. How many of you have sat underneath a broom tree and said, it's enough. I can't take this anymore. Just go ahead and end it, God. I'm not who I thought I was going to be. He says that. I'm no better than my father's. Who are you measuring yourself against? Who are you measuring yourself with? Because if you're looking around this room, you're saying, man, I'll never be what they are. That's not what God wants for us. 
The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. It's not about the enemy. It's not about the struggle. It's not even about us. There has to come a resurgence of a fight inside the body of Christ to push back against these things we're seeing. And it doesn't always mean picketing. That doesn't always mean standing outside of a business. Sometimes that means coming in on a Tuesday night and falling on your knees and saying, God, you've got to move. And leading the people you have influence over into that position, saying, we're going to seek the Lord together. We're going to do it at home. We're going to do it at church. Where's the fight, though? Does it bother you that you may or may not come to prayer? Does it bother you that you may, your family may or may not pray very much? Some of us have seasons where we do really great at that stuff, and then seasons where we get busy, we get distracted, or we just get down and we kind of isolate ourselves. God's calling us back to the front line. If the core of the church cannot stand side by side on the front lines of the battlefield, then the whole army behind us will falter. That's what they say. Do not falter. Do not step. Don't let the arm, don't let the, the, if there's a group of people pushing forward against an enemy, if one side starts to run, the whole battle's gone. If the front people begin to turn and run, everyone sees it. And God is calling us to sure ourselves up, to strengthen the front lines, to strengthen the core of the church, to start going back and doing the things that we first did when we first got saved, to start getting the passion that we once had back then, right now, amen? If you find yourself under a broom tree and you're trying to quit, I've come to tell you, God's not okay with that. God's not done. If you are just can't imagine your family or your friends or this community changing and getting saved and revival happening, God is not thinking that way. Many of us have turned in our resignation in the military and God is not stamping that paper. He's not done with you yet. God's not done. You may have thrown your sword. You may have hid out in a cave. You may have said, God, I'm done. He won't accept your resignation. Amen. It's time for us to lean into this, not go backward. Some of you have been doing this longer than me. You know what it's like to get hit with all the stuff that Christianity will hit you with. The seasons of a church, the seasons in your family, the seasons in your marriage, watching people in the church struggle and leave the church. It's worth it though. It's still worth it. I mean, I've been here through a lot of cycles of this church. And when I see students in a marriage as being men, it's still worth my time. Whether it's two couples up there in a marriage class or whether it's just me and my wife, it's still worth the time. The fight is for a reason. And I want to encourage you, it's not about the things that we find ourselves doing in church. God's calling us back to people. He's calling us to minister to people, not programs, not services, not classes. If you are not engaging people face to face, Elijah would go on to raise up two kings and a prophet. He sits under a broom tree and says, I'm done, but God has another assignment for him. And if he stopped at that broom tree, how many people would have sat in darkness for generations? Think about that. That's powerful. Some of us aren't the person to stand on a stage, but we're the person to raise up the person that stands on a stage. I can look around the room and I see people who are instrumental in raising me up. You have a part in everything that I do. And prayerfully, I have a part in some of your lives. It all works together. But if we sit under a broom tree and quit, if we back up into a cave saying, I can't take what the enemy's doing anymore, front lines falter and the enemy invades our camp. And we lose loved ones. We lose parts of our community. We lose ground. Drugs, alcoholism, abuse, child abuse, neglect. That stuff can go. That stuff can change. The atmosphere of our town can be different, but we must unite. We must recognize we have the power in Christ and we must lean into it. We've got to start attending church like we've never attended church. We've got to start coming in here worshiping like we've never worshiped before, regardless of who's preaching, regardless of who's doing worship. Amen. Elijah faced an enemy seemingly alone. The enemy had murdered God's priest publicly. The enemy held positions of power in the government. Think about this. Think of how defeated he felt. Everything he went to do for God, the people that were in charge of the government, the people who made all, called all the shots, they were idol worshipers. They were the ones doing horrible, horrible things. It felt like he couldn't change anything. 
Elijah had called down fire and seen miracles, but none of that mattered. His situation, coupled with his weariness and isolation, blinded his vision. Think about this. This is a prophet. This prophet knows people in another land, knows their name, knows exactly where to go because God speaks to him. But he doesn't know he's called to go raise up an Elisha prophet that's plowing a field, doing something super boring. There's Elijah, the prophet we're talking about, and then there's a follower that would come after him. His name is Elisha. And Elisha does not know that he's called to be a prophet. He just knows there's something important that God's called in my life. Elisha, the guy who's going to take over for this, is literally following a cow in a field, plowing it. The most boring job you could possibly imagine. What comes out the rear end of a cow? That's his daily life. That's what he's doing, right? That's his existence. And here's Elijah, the one who's called to go anoint him, raise him up as a prophet to change the entire nation. Elijah's sitting over at a broom tree, dead, quiet. I'm done. I'm just done. It's all about me. How many of us are not raising up the future generation because we have resigned ourselves to a pew? We've resigned ourselves to just teach a Sunday school class. It's time to do more. It's time to see the ministry God has for us in the face of people, not in the classroom. Amen? When we do the Easter egg hunt, it's not about the the softball fields. It's not about the eggs. It's about the people. They're sitting in darkness. For Elijah, his life had become all about temporary defeat. It's very easy to get there as a Christian. When you pray for your family for years and nothing changes, when you pray for friends for years and nothing changes, it's very easy to see that temporary defeat, because it is temporary, and to let that define your God, define your call, define everything about you. Let's tell the story of another guy. King David, before he was a king, was a sheep person. He took care of sheep. I don't know which is lower on the totem pole, the guy that stands behind a mule while they plow a field or the guy that hangs out with sheep and smells like sheep. You got Elisha, who's just plowing a field, waiting for someone to anoint him and raise him up as a prophet. And then you've got this guy named David sitting in a field taking care of sheep. Before he was ever king, there was a bad guy. Everyone say a bad guy. There were a bunch of bad guys, but there's one specific bad guy. The Philistines were the bad guys in David's day. They gathered their armies together in battle. The Philistines stood on one mountainside. The Israel stood on the other mountainside, and there was a valley between them. It was called the showdown for a reason. Amen. That's a perfect picture of it. A champion on the bad guy's side went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. He was from Gath. That's a place. And Philistine and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul, the king of God's people, heard all these words and all of Israel heard it, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's read what David, David enters into this scene. First Samuel 17. I told you I wasn't going to keep you long. We're nearing the end here. First Samuel 17, 26. When David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Think about that, reproach. David was asking for himself, but it's important to realize reproach. David was concerned about how this looked on God. David was concerned about how this looked to see an enemy taunting God's people openly unopposed. David was bothered by the fact that the darkness stood against the light and no one was going to do anything about it. This guy has not much of a track record. He's never worn armor. He's never had a battle except for in a field with sheep. But he is the only one even thinking about stepping out and fighting Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 31. We're going to jump a little bit. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for David. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Goliath, your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. And then go to verse 45, 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David saw this perfectly. This wasn't about a giant. This wasn't about armies. This was about an enemy defying the God of Israel. 
And he didn't take into consideration the size of their army or the size of Goliath. He didn't take into consideration his abilities or his feelings or what his brothers might think about him being there. He didn't care about any of those things. He put himself out there and he spent himself. He, it was going to cost him to do this, but it wasn't about him. And I think that's the difference maker for us as the warriors and the followers of Jesus. We have to start to refine our motivations. Why are you attending church? Why do you serve in Sunday school? Why do you spend time with that person in church to help them? What are your motivations? Because for David, it wasn't about getting kingdom. He wasn't trying to earn a kingdom here. He was bothered by the darkness. He was bothered by the fact that God, who is so great, had no revelation on earth think about that there was no testimony of the power of god on earth that's important how much does it bother us today that there are students attending school there are people we go to work with and they've not even heard of jesus read a bible or seen a testimony of the change that jesus can bring how much does it bother us that darkness has invaded our community our family maybe even our marriage and our family our personal family How much does that bother us? Does it bother us like David did? Because David literally was recklessly running out to battle. He didn't consider himself. He didn't consider the giant. He said, there's a problem. That can't stand. That guy's not allowed to to taunt my God. I've got to step out. If you're not going to do it and you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. Man, that is powerful. God is wanting to raise that kind of spirit up in us. It's not about our church. It's not about our worship team. It's not about the preachers. It's about the darkness. When we don't care how it happens, we just want the darkness to retreat, then God will raise up a witness on earth. When we're more consumed with the glory of God and the power of God and not the preaching style of a man, man, God will show himself. He will demonstrate his power on the earth. But we must humble ourselves. David spent years in a field, no one checking up on him. Some of us have spent years serving in this church. No one even knows what you do. You don't care. You're just there and you know it's about people. That's what David went through. He went through seasons of humbling, seasons of making it about God. I mean, think about it. He could have quit a long time ago, just like Elijah did, just like Gideon did. David could have already quit. So what if a bear takes a sheep? Who cares? No one even notices. It's just one sheep. But David had something built in him that God gave him. It was this ownership. God gave me this task. These sheep matter to God, so therefore they matter to me. It was a personal ownership, and he took it seriously. See, if you are faithful in the small things, God will make you ruler over many things. You wonder why doors aren't opening. Maybe you're not being faithful in the small things. Maybe it's about you and not about the people, the sheep. Maybe it's not about pushing back the darkness. Maybe we need to refine our motives. Maybe we need to go through some seasons where it's really lowly servant time, just like David had. David could have quit a long time ago. No one even notices if I watch the sheep. He can lay over in the ditch and just sleep it off. And if sheep run off, who cares? Only if he loses 50 will someone say something. There was character there. Character that was built up over time. And I feel like we have that. But God still wants to strengthen, encourage, and refine. What are you really doing this for? Because he doesn't give his glory liberally. He doesn't give it lightly. There are people who were used of God. I can think of, I can name off preachers who I've watched over the years on TV. And when you watch early versions of them teaching and preaching, you felt the Lord and you saw sincerity in their voice and you knew that there were souls being saved under them. But then years later, you'll find that that sincerity was gone and that it was about them and it was about what they were offering. And it wasn't about the glory of God. It wasn't about pushing back the darkness. That's what every one of us can get to. Every one of us. If God gives us a platform and we haven't truly surrendered our motives to him, we can be misused. We can make it about us. And that's why this work, this word is so important. It's not because I'm preaching. Because if God's going to elevate this church to reach and give influence to reach, he has to trust its members. And I'm not talking about the Sunday morning onlys, the empty chair people. Imagine them. They're here in spirit. No, I'm talking about us. 
Our motives have to be sincere and pure. We have to want it for the right reasons. Can't charge Goliath with our own, with our own glory in mind because we'll fall. We'll fall. And not only will we fall, but everyone behind us will fall. Motives. David came at the fight differently than Gideon did, differently than Elijah did. I mean, think about this. When David beat Goliath, it turned the tide of the entire fight. Everything shifted. And when we look at Gideon, God began to speak to him. God is, the Lord is with you, mighty man of war. And days later, the turn of the tide came. He had to have a revelation of God to get up out of the cave and to stop isolating himself. He had to get a fight put in him, but it came from the presence of God. Amen. But it was all within a matter of days. There was defeat. There was utter chaos. There was just hopelessness. But all these stories had victory within days, within weeks, within months. They were right on the verge of something truly powerful. Think about that. What if you quit now? What if you stay the way you've been spiritually? Oh, you're doing good things. You're praying. You're going to church. But what if you refuse to step into the deeper things of God? What will it cost the people that follow you? What will it cost our community? What will it cost these kids who don't have a mom and dad in their life? If you refuse to mentor them, if you refuse to spend time with them, what does it cost those people? Because the victory is like really close. Gideon would go on to raise up 300 men and they would turn the entire multitude of bad guys running. They slew them day and night. I don't know how they did this. Their arms had to be tired. They literally killed bad guys for hours. That's crazy. But God, what if Gideon would have quit? What if Gideon would have just said, I'm just going to go to church. I'm not going to step out and be uncomfortable. I'm not going to do hard things for God. Just be comfortable. Gideon would have missed that victory. His entire family would have missed that victory. His entire nation would have sat in darkness. And it's weird to think that some of us, the victory hinges on us. But I promise you, some of you, it does. Some of you it does, because if you don't start stepping into what God's called you to do, you won't be the person you're supposed to be standing in this altar leading someone through to victory. And that person won't go on to become a youth pastor. That person won't come on, go on to be a teacher in a school raising up Christians and reaching people that you can't reach. Every one of us, the victory hinges on you coming out of the cave. The victory hinges on you getting up from underneath the broom tree and moving forward. Push past the discomfort. Push past the, the, the losses that we've all faced. Push past it. How long will you go on mourning the past? How long will you go on focused on the failures? What if in a matter of days and weeks, the victory is at hand? And all we got to do is just pick up the sword. We just got to lean back into what God's called us to do 20 years ago. God's raising us back up with a new vigor, with a new mentality that we can win the day. We can turn the tide. We can push back the darkness if we just unite and we push forward into this and we trust in his power, not our own. When you come to the end of yourself, when the risk is the highest, when you've hit your breaking point, when no one stands beside you in your fight, it's usually when the giant's about to fall. It's huge. It's huge. David had fought lions. David had fought bears. All of those moments protecting those sheep, they all culminated. He went through the process for this moment to turn the tide of the battle. A nobody. But no one was standing beside him. In fact, his brothers were taunting him. Even the king tried to manipulate him. That's powerful. Even people in charge, even people you respect and admire may misunderstand your call and how you're supposed to do things. And you may have to just go ahead and buckle down and do what God's telling you to do. Amen? That's, sometimes that happens. King Saul was telling him to do something he wasn't called to do. If we are to fight fearlessly, if we are going to see our friends and family that the enemy has stolen from us, restored to us, this fight cannot be about us. We have to fight for something greater. Um, anyone ever heard of cinching up the... the gird of your loins. I, I think I'm butchering the phrasing. It's like an old King James. That imagery, I want you to get that because I, I think that there's an element of that in this. God isn't going to just do all this work. You're going to have to straighten out some things. I am going to have to straighten out some things. I got to realign some priorities. Amen. I got I to gotta stop giving in to just being distracted 24 seven. 
I can't, I can't check out and check out from what God's calling me to do for the rest of the day. I can't do that. It has to be a warfare mindset. 2 Timothy 2, 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. If you've been in the military, or you've even watched military shows, they cannot even go to the bathroom unless their commanding officer says they can. I'm not saying we got to be there as Christians, but God's calling us to get a little more straight and narrow. He's calling us to get a little more tight. Amen. He's calling us to know each other better. We can't win focused on our issues, our struggles, our doubts. We must submit ourselves to the Lord and march forward with one goal, restoring God's great name on the earth. That's why these miracles that happen in a, in a service like this are so important because they give witness to the reality of our God. They, they bear witness to the truth that we all espouse with our daily life. That's why signs and wonders should follow us, and we shouldn't follow the signs and wonders. Because God wants to confirm what we're saying and what we're living. God wants to do that. But we have to have his heart. We have to care about the people more than we do all this other stuff. Amen? And it can't be about us. God will push back the darkness. He will give us victory over giants. But we must be about the Father's business, not our business. How much do you spend of your day focused on reaching somebody, ministering to somebody, loving somebody, speaking truth to somebody? How much? Because if you spend your whole day and not even think about that one time, that's what we're talking about. That's what God's trying to correct in us. He wants us to get back in the fight with, with our minds. We've checked out some of us. We've laid aside the sword. When we speak to people, we'll let it be with redemption in mind. When we serve, it's with the hope that God gets glory for it. Gideon was living a life void of God's purpose. There was an army to conquer. God designed everything to happen with Gideon in mind. It hinged on Gideon getting out of the cave. It hinged on Gideon doing what God was telling him to do. I just, I wish for anything that God would let us see all the people that are in the balance if we don't respond to what God's telling us to do. That would change everything for us. If he flashed every face, every one of your family members that are maybe not gonna make it to heaven, if you don't step into what God's called you to do, if you don't do the hard work and correct your relationship with him and maybe correct your family situation, if you don't do those things, who, who suffers from that? Who suffers from that, amen? There's a lot of cool stuff I won't get into. Um, what has caused you to lay down your sword? If you could uh, bow your head and just kind of be alone with the Lord right now, I want to lead you in some prayer. What has caused you to lay down your sword? What has you living your life in hiding? Where did your fight go? For some of you, this message might not apply. But for a lot of us, it does. Come out of your cave. Go anoint the people that God has called you to anoint. Raise up some prophets. It's time to kill giants. Ultimately, we got to ask ourselves the same thing we asked a long time ago. Will you give yourself in service to the Lord? Will you fight for his great name? Is it about you or is it about our God's name on the earth? Just evaluate your heart. You and God, not me. You and God, me and God. If you've lost the will to fight, if you're in hiding, if you're not investing in relationships because you've been hurt by relationships, God wants to straighten that out. You cannot fight in this army and keep people at arm's length. You can't do it. We must stand as one. And if you've been burned, you've got to let God deal with that. Will you give yourself in service to the Lord? Who will rise up for their king? There's an army to fight. There's darkness to push back. There are prophets to raise up. There are kings to raise up. There are people with influence that you are called to raise up in this church people who go on to be a principal of a school, go on to be business leaders, you are called to raise them up. 
Will you submit yourself one more time to the service of Jesus? I want you to ask yourself that. You can go ahead and bring the volume up on that if you want, brother. Sweet. If you feel God is challenging you, if you feel this message was directed at you and some of the situations you're facing or you have faced, I want to challenge you to come and find a place where you are giving your life back to the service of the Lord. You're willing to be hurt serving him by people. You're willing to give yourself and your time to people to raise them up. You're willing to realign some priorities. If you feel God challenging you to step back in and stand on the front lines, why don't you come to this front and let's get alone with the Lord. You have to give yourself to Jesus, not as salvation, but as warriors. Have you been out of the fight? Have you laid back when you should have been leaning in? If God's calling you to do more, to be more, would you come up here and join us in prayer? You can turn that volume up on there. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. No matter what defeat you face, no matter what situations you've struggled against, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. He's asking, who will stand by my side? Who will fight for me? God, would you raise up some Davids? Would you raise up some Elishas? God, would you use us?